Welcome. My name's Andy Harris. Today we're at my latest exhibition, Bites, Brands, Words, and Wheels, at the Gordon Art Galleries on the campus of Old Dominion University. Come on, let's take a look. When walking through the exhibition, we start off with this first collage, Death Scooter. Death Scooter is a um, image of a Grim Reaper on one of these like lime scooters with spikes and things on it. Now, this is a great example I wanted to start the show off with because it shows exactly uh, what my work's all about. I do a lot of painting, I do a lot of drawing, and I do a lot of experimentation. As you walk past the exhibition title, you come to a wall where you see the uh, 20 collages that make up the Fell in Love in Brazil project. Each piece confronts concepts such as power, isolation, death, religion. I was tasked with working uh, with a British rapper named Jevin, and I was uh, asked to create artwork for each song on his new record. And so I would, I would listen to the song, I would get a feeling of what I thought it meant, and I would create 10 to 20 pieces per song. We would sift through them and, and you know, the, the winner would, would surface and that's what we would go with. Although I am left with a beautiful body of work. These pieces were very new for me. And what I mean by that is they really got me out of my comfort zone. I'm not used to doing razors with a Playboy bunny sign etched into it. I'm not used to doing a skeleton hand with an hourglass pouring out. And I resisted it first. But I went for it and I came across something totally beautiful. I found that a lot of times I limit myself as an artist and by doing that I really limit the, uh, the amount of artwork and the productivity that I could potentially reach. And to be honest, a couple of these pieces have been some of my uh, favorite work so far. As we get to the end of the row of I Fell in Love in Brazil project, we come to uh, an empty roadway, and actually this is in response to the quarantine. I created it early in, um, I created it early in April, and I was thinking of the Beatles Abbey Road cover, and what if you took all of the cars and all of the people out of the coverage, what would it look like? I, I really felt that it fit with the times. For some reason, I'm fascinated with abandoned bicycles. Um, this piece right here is the Salvation Army bike. What we see is a black bike with super fat tires on a kickstand leaning up against or close to um, a red building which is actually a Salvation Army close to my house. Now this bike was super beat up. Um, actually saw it one day, took a picture of it and, and kept it in my photo library and said, hey, I'm gonna make this one day. And uh, I was given the opportunity to, so I did. Now, bikes are a pain to make collage, drawing, painting, whatever. There's so many moving parts, so many mechanics. But what I found is that, like, that discomfort of approaching something like that, you get to the other side of something. You have a, I have a feeling of accomplishment once I do that. And I always like the way they turn out. Even if something's warped, even if something's distorted, I love the soul of the bike that I've created once it's all said and done. Then we move over to essential workers. Essential workers, we see a yellow bus with figures in the windows, with N95 masks, we see buildings, we see smog or exhaust coming from the back of the bus. Now, in Norfolk, there aren't yellow buses. The buses are white, and black, and blue. I kind of took a, you know, artistic license over that and wanted to do yellow, so I did yellow. But when the pandemic started in 2020, I was at a stoplight leaving work. I knew I wasn't going back teaching face-to-face -face for a while, and I pull up next to this city bus full of people, half wearing masks, half not wearing masks. Uh, that image kind of stuck with me. With everything going on, I was super sensitive at the time, and I always kind of kept that mental image in my head. So uh, I just started making it one day. Uh, I have one figure not wearing a mask to kind of represent uh, a fear, to represent um, essential workers having to go to work and putting their lives at risk. 
I also use local signage on the bus in place of the ads. So anyone in my neighborhood knows exactly where those come from when looking at this piece. We come to this wall with three works on it. These pieces are really important to me, so I wanted it to have a powerful visual impact for the viewer. I almost wanted it to look like a church altar where the central figure was most powerful and the lighter things draw you towards it. Here we see where my bike collages are beginning to go. We see more detail, more shadow play, more things that don't make sense but seem like they make sense for some reason. And then to the left and the right, we see a little bit lighter pieces, smaller collages, that play into the themes of good and evil. This work was included in the show because it's an object. It's actually my friend's gauntlet. Now, a gauntlet is a wristband, a spiked wristband that uh, heavy metal thrash, crossover thrash musicians wear when performing live. Um, and this one was actually a friend of mine. The spikes coming off to the right were a good lesson for me in learning about applying shadow to the positive and negative spaces of my work. I created this piece at a two-week residency in Ohio in 2019. This piece is titled Miller School, and it's actually a, a screenshot from the movie Toy Soldiers. Miller School is a, used to be a military school um, outside of Charlottesville. When I was in uh, middle school, it's where all the bad kids went. Um, and so when that movie came out, um, and you know, watching it all growing up, I always remembered thinking, wow, that's, that's Virginia, cool. Now this particular scene, we see this flying airplane um, but I've called it a drone while making it because I'm trying to make a connection to the present day. In the film, the remote-controlled airplane plays a key role in defeating the terrorist. Um, so I just, I, there's something about that. There's something about showing the building, it being in Virginia, that I just had to make. This is also one work in a series I'm doing of objects or stills that are from documentaries, movies, television shows, things like that. To the left we have a vase that was in the background of a uh, Patrick Swayze documentary and then to the right um, is some pottery, some contemporary pottery that was in the background of an episode of uh, MTV's My So-Called Life. This collage is titled Virginia as seen from Silence of the Lambs. And um, if you've ever seen the movie, the beginning takes place in Quantico, Virginia. The titles are a, a bold black with a white stroke. Now, much of the movie is shot from a first person perspective. And even though there's no people in this shot, this has the same look. It was very smart as far as the way they directed that movie. Um, and this really caught my eye. This plays into the series of works that I, I'm making of showing Virginia through film. This work is titled Tourney Van. It's a uh, Taekwondo van used uh, to, to take members to and from tournaments. But really, it's on my walk every single day at work to uh, leave lunch and go grab a cup of coffee. I see it every day, and it's still there. Um, but it plays into all the things I'm interested in. I, I, uh, I created it to be isolated. There's type going down the side, which I changed a little bit. We have the wheels. The van never goes anywhere, so it kind of plays into that whole abandoned object. I leave you with this final piece titled Misadventures. We see an alien ship abducting a human form. I wanted to include this in with the exhibition because it's kind of where my work has been heading lately. It doesn't necessarily fall into the theme of the exhibition, but it's almost like a to be continued. 
I'm really interested in the misadventures of human beings. So a lot of these works in my show are made in similar ways, uh, but here and there I'm experimenting and trying new methods and trying new things. I paint a bunch of paper, it kind of uh, feeds that need to paint, and I collect, I collect the things I paint. So I have stacks and stacks of painted paper. Um, I then, you know, from having an idea, I can go one of two ways. I can get more free-flowing, start riffing, just throwing paper up and seeing what happens and seeing where it goes. Or I can start with like a sketch or a drawing and build, uh, build a piece that is a little bit more thought out and with a solid direction. This exhibition has a nice blend of the two. And I think you can tell when you walk through which is which. Um, a lot of times I will, I'll work from photographs. Part of, part of my process is photographing the weird things I see with my iPhone because it's so quick and easy and it gives me that nice unpolished look that I like. Uh, so I have a phone with thousands of weird pictures in them. Um, I'll collect, I'll flag the ones that are most powerful to me that I think are, uh, they're, there's something there, they're saying something, they need to be explored more. And then I have some that just sit there for years until I finally delete them off my phone. Uh, but I'm always looking to expand. I'm always looking to push myself and, and to go further. There's a delicate balance within this show. We have very illustrative works, but then I also have uh, some more abstract themes going on as well. So you can kind of see how ADD I am, <laughs> how scatterbrained and all over the place I can be. I get bored really easy, so I try to uh, just keep making to keep interested. It's funny, I'll stumble upon a concept that I really like or an idea, and I'm like, wow, I could take this, I could do 20 pieces with this. I already have the 20 ideas, and the second I'm done with the second one, I'm done with it. I'm like, I'm ready for the next. What's the next thing? It's the one area in my life, I think, I'm like that because everything else, I like to go to bed at the same time, I like to eat the same thing, I like to, uh, I like routine, I like stability. My artwork, on the other hand, is <laughs> a little different than that. I'm always searching to fill, if that makes any sense. Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Cullen Strawn. I'm the executive director for the arts at Old Dominion University, and we're very glad to uh, be in this exhibition tour with artist Andy Harris, um, whose exhibitions, exhibition Bike Brands, Words, and Wheels is currently on view uh, just for about one more week at the Gordon Art Galleries. Um, wanted to also take this opportunity to introduce you to our newest team member, uh, at Arts at ODU and the Gordon Galleries. This is Gordon, the telepresence robot. Um, and he's joining us here in the galleries, giving people around the world a chance to go through the exhibitions, including Andy's, uh, again, for about another week. So go online on social media, at ODU Arts on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram uh, to find out how you can log into Gordon and operate Gordon and tool through the galleries. Also, you can check odu.edu slash arts. And I think Andy's online. Andy, how are you doing? Doing great. Doing great. Thanks for having me tonight. Uh, I do warn you about Gordon. He tried to steal my wallet while I was looking at something a little while ago. Um, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I know, you know, I'm honored that you have taken some time to uh, spend with me and to... Um, here we talk even further <laughs> about my work. Um, and the first piece we're here at tonight is um, a collage entitled, It's for a Friend. And uh, I think you can connect the dots on why I wanted to call it that. It's a tube of hemorrhoid cream and it's like one of those embarrassing things that uh, I've never had to buy it before. Uh, so, you know, when you have to buy it, you say it's for a friend. Um, but really, um, you know, with this piece, it was the uh, it was the type 
it was the descriptions on the label that kind of pulled my attention. Um, it was this like, I, I liked the colors on the tube. I saw the yellow and then the complimentary purple. And um, so they were kind of uplifting colors. Yet at the same time, the words were very uh, associated with pain and discomfort. We have, uh, you know, burning, painful, itching, discomfort. So um, irritation. Um, so really the words are what, uh, what drives the piece in my opinion. Um, another thing too is like, I think almost every collage that I make, there's an attempt at like trying to find that, uh, the way of making that's going to be least, uh, painless for me. And so um, this is one of the early on works where I decided to get rid of the, the sketches and the drawings. I still sketched this out before, like in process, she sketched it out. But when I started to create it, I almost just, um, what do you want to call it? Freehanded, right? So I just started building without, you know, making a grid or, or following some elaborate plan. Uh, prior to this, I had pieces that were quite complicated and I was like, okay, this piece is going to be number four, this is five, this is six, and it was like a putting together a puzzle, which gives you this really clean look at the end, but it's almost sterile. It's almost um, void of any kind of like real human uh, connection for me. And so uh, this is one of the first ones where I just started kind of going for it. And uh, in person, you can, you can see some of those inconsistencies, um, but... Overall, it, it told me that it was a direction that I wanted to explore a little more. Um, also, you'll notice this is uh, the edge. It has like a full inch of white border. And this is just like technical stuff. This isn't, you know, there's a full uh, inch of white border around. I've since kind of cut that down. It was cool for this piece because it was big. But now I want to, um, it framed it too much. So I, I want to give it just a little bit more room. So I'm, I'm taking it closer to the edges these days. But uh, why don't we move over to these uh, pieces right next to this. All right. So uh, when I proposed the show to ODU, um, originally I wanted to call it poached and I wanted it to be all bicycles. Um, and so early on, what I did is I started breaking, deconstructing a bicycle. So we had uh, pedals, handlebars, saddle, um, the fork, you know, everything. So I started making collages, a lot of collages that didn't make it into the show, but it was more about me trying to understand the parts of a bike. Because I don't know about you, but when I see a bike and I'm like, I got to, if I have to work on a bicycle, the parts stress me out and I'm like, oh my God, I'm like, oh, this is easy. Just so I'll get some pliers and unscrew this. And then I go to unscrew it and I just strip the thing and I can't even get like the simple bolt off. And if I select the correct tool, I can't tighten it back once I'm done working on it. So um, I wanted to make sure that I kind of understood what parts went into what on a bicycle. And one of the first ones I, I uh, started messing around with was the saddle. This is like the only like process collage. This was never meant to be framed. This was meant to maybe go into a folder and never see the light of day. Uh, but there was something um, I, I probably finished, you know, after filling in the background, I probably finished the actual collage in like 20 minutes, which is really good because it's again, getting back to that free flowing. I think um, the most genuine artwork that I'm interested in that I get connected to and not even just my own others is when I see this sense of looseness and confidence. And so those are some things I try to strive for. Below that, we have a um, at-home marijuana drug test. And this was a, a simple still life study. I, I was at the dollar store and I bought like pregnancy tests, drug tests, um, things that you probably don't want to get at a dollar store. <laughs> uh, so I, I you know, bought a bag full of these things. And um, it was like, it was, I didn't really know what I wanted to create. I didn't have anything at the moment that I wanted to say. I just knew I wanted to make. And so I had these weird objects, these uh, strange products on a table, and I began doing still life observations of them. Um, this one um, I've shown before and priced it at $420. 
And, and actually, uh, this one, you know, it, people connect with it for some, for some reason, and, and I end up talking to a lot of people about it. Um, the one thing that kind of got me was like the advertising that it was like 98% accurate, and it's a drug test. Typically, if you're taking a drug test, it's because your, your job's on the line, your, your residence is on the line or something. You're not taking it for fun. You're not like, hey, come over. Let's take some drug tests tonight. And to, to, uh, to promote the fact that it's only 98% accurate is kind of, I don't know, there was like a funny joke there. And I think a lot of my work, I, you know, if something's funny to me or something's kind of like tongue in cheek, I like to explore that. I like to, to, to create that just to keep things light. Uh, speaking of drugs, why don't we look at this other piece over here? Andy, can I put some questions to you while you travel? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, right on. Okay, so first question from Caitlin is, uh, Andy, your work is sometimes very abstract and other times it's highly detailed and representational. How do you decide how each piece should operate? The show looks great. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, I think just as an artist, you know, seeing that video and, and having a few talks associated with the show, I, I get kind of sick of hearing myself try to explain something that sometimes there's just no explanation for it. But um, I think I'm going to, I'll give this one a shot. So I think that abstract works are an effort or an attempt for me to go with something deeper than just a, a, a drug test joke, you know? Um, it's, it's searching, it's, it's creating on a more personal level where um, a lot of times it's almost like this, like when you're a kid and you draw like a cartoon character and it looks like that cartoon character, there was this like amazing feeling that you got. And then your friends or your parents were like, oh my God, you drew that. And I think in a way, I, you know, something inside me chases that. But then there's the, the one side of me that says, you know, you should try growing and, and not caring what people think about what you make. So I think what you see is that, that, you know, battle that goes on with the artist that, that happens with the creative. It's like, is what I'm doing uh, worthy? Is what I'm doing worth time? Um, that, that constant back and forth. I really think at the end of the day, it just depends on how I feel. I mean, how you feel when you wake up on any given day. I always want things to be black and white and they're just not. I've gone off on a kind of a crazy tangent. I will say this too. Um, a lot of times with some more abstract works, um, in the process of creating my papers, which is a real like just primal and loose activity in itself, a lot of times a sheet of paper will fall on another sheet of paper and there'll be this like great connection between the two and I'll throw it together in a collage really quickly on a whim. And there's something about it that is, um, that's really strong, you know, whether it's the design, the emotion. Um, and, and so I'll keep it. And then, you know, maybe one out of 10 could make it into like a frame where I want to like put it out there as an example or representation of my work. So uh, I think, you know, there's a nice mix, a nice balance. So if we look at this piece right here, you know, Early on, I was just cutting up paper that had a light value at the top and then a harsh edge with a dark value, but one piece of paper. So I started cutting that and saying, well, this you know, could be maybe the side of a building, could be the bottom of a boat in water. And then um, I, I've had this idea of doing prescription drugs, but changing the messages on them instead of just random numbers, um, maybe, you know, messages connected to, you know, how we view pharmaceuticals in this country. Uh, and so I had that already playing in the back of my head. And then I was like, oh, yeah, like that looks like a Xanax bar. Um, and so that's when I decided to do the same thing on a smaller scale for the little divots in them. And then, uh, you know, I had these these Xanax bars and I was like, OK, well, maybe I could change the messages in them. And so that's why I kind of went with take four of these. Um, it, on one hand, it's kind of like a... Um, it's kind of like one of those pieces that you'll see in contemporary art where like the words crossed out or the words are all put together in one sentence and it makes you stand there and figure out what it's trying to say. So there's a little bit of that going on there with the T and the H not being connected. And then this one that says OF space T. But um, like that question, right? So I was at first playing with this abstract form 
and then realize that it, it could take on a much more uh, rendered object. And um, I was pretty pleased. I mean, I was pleased with it. it. The reason I didn't just put this on a, uh, a blank black background is because I wanted some information. I wanted some texture. I wanted, um, I wanted a nice book to hold the story, I guess. I didn't want just some, something random. Yeah. Um, so this piece is titled Take Four of These. Again, it, I think it takes a little bit more mature uh, kind of spin than the drug test. It's like we, uh, a doctor is so quick to tell me, here, just try this, you know, oh, your back hurts. Uh, doesn't ask what I've been eating, doesn't ask how I've been sleeping, doesn't ask how I've been moving or my lifestyle, but it's like, this will get rid of the pain and this will get you out of my office for, you know, for the time being. So I guess, you know, um, this, ha this is connected to a, a, a bit of a, of a deeper issue at hand. Yeah. Uh, Colin, do we have any other questions before we move over? Absolutely. And um, I'm going to skip down a few questions while you're standing there right at the gauntlet, gauntlet piece to ask a question from Amanda, who wrote in to ask, has your background in music crossed over into your themes besides the gauntlet piece? Yeah, absolutely. So it might not, it, it might not be as blatant as you think. Um, so I learned to play music pretty much by instinct and just by picking up something and, and making a noise with it and then getting better at making a noise with it. And, um, and, and, I, and I learned to write and compose music in the same way. And so uh, in all the bands that I've been in, I, I've contributed, you know, bands are collaborations. You, there's parts of them that are a lot of fun and there's parts where you want to pull your hair out because they don't see the same way you see. And it's about dealing with that. And sometimes you're right and a lot of times you're wrong. And uh, the beauty comes with a group of people coming together and making something that not one could make on their own. And uh, so with, with my art making, with, with, with the collages that you see in here, um, I, I do this thing where I just make, right? So with songs and like with like, if I'm making like a punk song or something, I just make, I just fit the riffs together and then put it out there and see if it sticks or not. And a lot of times my, my artwork's the same, my physical artwork is the same way. I, um, I just create and not every time I'm really happy with it, it's kind of like you're viewing each piece as a song almost, right? A song and an album. This album's called, you know, the title of the show and there's way too many songs in it, but, uh, you know, things, I made a bunch of stuff and I, I threw it out there and I saw what sticks. So there definitely is overlap, overlap. As far as like music culture, like taking like a visual predominance in my work, not really. Um, this, the, the spiked gauntlet piece was this bright idea I had where I was going to like hit up every like famous heavy metal head that was still alive and asked for one of their a picture of one of their accessories. And I was going to have an entire show of accessories and uh, nobody would give me the time of day. So I got bored with it really quickly. So this was like the first one in that series and it lived its life out. It's a great piece. I don't know what I'm going to do with it. I might give it to my friend, Ryan, uh, um, because it's his, but I don't know if he wants his own hand in, <laughs> in his house, but maybe so. Uh, it's like, you know, some kind of a weird self portrait. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, we have several more questions that have come in, but if you, um, if you want to talk a bit more about another piece, we can kind of stagger those. Excellent. Yeah, let's do that. Let's go take a look at this bicycle collage I created. All right. Sounds great. And then we'll have, we have a bicycle related question that we will put to Oh, excellent. And, and I want to thank you guys for the questions. Uh, first, it's, it's warming to hear your interest, but it's also, um, I feel like there's some, usually the people wanting to ask questions, there's some creative thing there. And I love sharing information and sharing ideas. That's why I'm a teacher because I get to do it every day. So, all right. Uh, let's, let's hit a question first before I start talking. Is that cool? Yeah. This question is from Jacqueline. Really love your work. Although as a cyclist, I have a bit of a bias. I would love to hear more about the materials you use in your collages and how you select the color that you use. Hmm. 
All right, great. Um, the materials I use um, is, well, I've learned that a lot of paper made today, whether it's butcher paper or whatever, is acid free. There was this like, it might not all be like archival, meaning it's going to last a thousand years, but the, the word on the street from what I've learned is um, these big paper factories, it's cost them a lot of money to make things, to not make things acid free. So they've gone like completely acid free. So what I've done is I've uh, right near my studio, I always see them chopping up these huge rolls of paper and, and getting paid to recycle them. And so I just walk over there with uh, we've worked out a deal, five bucks for a roll. So I'll walk in with ten dollars and I'll leave with two rolls of paper this big and that round. And uh, it's different weight. A lot of times they're called blem rolls. And that means there's something wrong with them, whether it's the weight or the texture. And so they have to get rid of it. Um, so I've grabbed these huge rolls and um, I am using more archival uh, primers and paints. Uh, with this last Jevin project, I was given you know, money to make the project happen. So I stepped my game up as far as materials and I'm using like golden paints, which are just superior to any of the like $5 tubes of paint out there. It's kind of bad because you can really drop $500 on supplies really quickly. Um, so I've been using more like uh, archival uh, paints. This piece right here is on canvas. So I build my own frames when I'm working on canvas and I stretch them and I prime them. There's something about working. I think professional artists working on store-bought frames that just doesn't jive well with me. It just feels really impersonal. And it's, it's like, if I'm going to, if I'm going to buy something from someone, I don't want to see it on a store. I, I want to see like, maybe they even paid someone who knows what they're doing to build the frame. That's just kind of a little, uh, you know, my little attitude towards it. But um, so, so this piece is a bunch of painted paper on canvas and, and I work on canvas from time to time. But what I found is that when I, um, so this, this frame, it took me two hours to go buy the wood, to cut it down into strips, to build the frame took me an hour to uh, stretch it and maybe an hour to prime it um, total. So you're looking at a lot of money and a lot of time into building just the, just the frame. And, and I'm, I'm at the point in my, my art career where, you know, I'm still doing this or whatever, where I, I know other artists pay just for the whole thing. Um, but that being said, all of that pressure to make something that's going to be impactful is really weighing on my shoulders when I'm working on something that's taking me so long and so much money. So what I've done to kind of jump over that is I started working on like really high quality uh, thick paper that I buy from a, a company outside of Brooklyn. It's like uh, thick rolls of really nice paper. And I, um, I prime both sides. So it's nice and thick and it lays flat somewhat. But what I'm, I mean, here's the thing, right? I can make 20 pieces of paper prime and ready to go. It won't take me that long. And I can start collaging on it. And if I mess up, I tear it and I throw it away. Um, it, it gets rid of that like fear of messing up my surface. Um, but by the time I got to this piece, which was the last piece I've created before this show, I, I mean, I had been making at, at least 15 to 20 collages a week. Um, so when I got to this point, I had kind of shaken off that fear of messing up. And I know now just to go for it. Um, that's been a great thing, uh, a great moment in my career to, to achieve is just to be able to go for it and not worry about that. But at first, when you're when you don't have a show or a residency or something you're applying for and you just have this blank canvas, it can be daunting to put your um, materials on the on the surface. Uh, so this piece right here is um, a green Raleigh uh, abandoned but locked up to a pole. And it kind of encompasses the whole thing, uh, the whole idea of why I was interested in bikes in the first place. I wasn't interested in like nice bikes. I was actually interested in uh, maybe nice bikes that had been locked up and abandoned and uh, stripped. Um, there was something about that when you walk through a city and you see these things. I mean, if you, if you give it the time of thought, you think about, okay, whose bike is this? Are they in jail? Are they alive? Do, are they rich and they don't care? <laughs> uh, you know, are they not well? Why is their bike? And poor thing, that was a really nice bike, but now it doesn't have tires or a seat or a saddle. Um, so all this stuff can go into it. 
there's like, you can really go and push it and like, there's stories there, right? There, it's rich in stories, a locked up bike. But it's one of those things we just walk right by. It's one of those things we don't, I mean, I don't. It's, it's almost me taking something that we see every day, pulling it out of context and using it to juice up my work, to tell my stories. Now, um, this piece in particular, um, I, I'm not sure if I'm going to make, I might make some more bike collages, but I think I might be over it for now. And I knew that. So I went for it and I was like, just layer, layer. There, if you could get your hands and rub it down the face of this thing, I mean, it, the piece is really layered up. Um, part of that are, is uh, me overlapping to fix edges, right? If one goes too far, I have to put another one to reshape the edge. But also, I mean, in a, if you look at a photograph, if you look at a bike sitting there and you think, okay, I have to make either, it's like analog Photoshop. There's like 40 layers right there, <laughs> but it doesn't seem like it. It seems like, oh, yeah. But the things are layered up and layered up. It's, it's very strange to think about things, to think about real objects in layers. Um, I just kind of, uh, I put the brand, the brand Raleigh on it because I was born in Durham, North Carolina. It's kind of a cheesy little uh, thing, but um, I had never really uh, poked any um, information towards my hometown before my pieces, I don't think. So I wanted to wanted to do it i want you know whatever it, it might be cheesy but go for it I'm, I'm i'm cool with it although some stuff is quite realistic and quite rendered i also just got a simple hole puncher uh from the you know from the dollar store and punched uh holes um in in black and, and blue paper to give the tires tread which you probably can't see right here but in person there are these like dotted tread marks on the tires which aren't real right it's not very rendered but what it does is it says, hey, those tires are, are treaded. Move on to the next thing. It, tells, it sends a signal to our, our brains, um, my brain anyway. Would we like to take another question before we go to the next one? Uh, Jackie followed up by saying, so true about the stories of abandoned bikes. They speak volumes. And uh, I'm put in mind of a couple times a, a year at ODU, uh, there will be a, a bike sale which consists of all of the abandoned bikes that have been, you know, abandoned for that half of the year, left at bike racks and around campus and so on. So it's always good to uh, see those, find a new home. Um, and yeah, we can uh, move on to another question. Um, one of them is that, you, you know, you call these paintings scissor collages. Um, do you actually use scissors to cut up the pieces of paper and, and materials, or do you, do you use some other tools as well? Yeah, so uh, I actually call the collage of scissor painting. So like, um, I've painted for years, but I never really, I always felt like I was, you know, every once in a while I'd make a good one, but for the most part, I was never really satisfied. And then the way I got to collage was, you know, um, cutting paper and then, they, oh, I like that edge. Um, that's what I was going for. And I did it effortlessly almost. Um, so that's kind of, that was part of me like going towards collage, um, but still being able to paint. Um, I used to hang wallpaper before I started teaching. So, you know, um, what that looked like was, okay, we're renovating a hotel. I get a huge bolt of paper. I glue it up. I step up on a bench. I put it on the wall. I smooth it out. I get a knife out. I cut the seams. I put them together. I roll it together. And then I move to the next one. You know, that's very similar to the way I'm making these pieces. And I even use the same tool. So I use a, a small Ulfa knife with a snap blade, but I, I use a particular blade that uh, doesn't last as long, but they're super sharp. So I can get really fine cuts. I don't use wallpaper smoothers. I, I try to get smaller ones because um, if I was working on a collage that was the size of this wall, I would get a much bigger one. But you know, with a piece like this, I'm using smoothers about this big to this big. And a lot of times using the corners of them. I like something with a little bit of flex, not a lot, but some. And then yes, yeah, scissors. Um, the more I make, the better I'm getting with them. Now, uh, I mean, I'm not like, I'm not where I want to be with them, but I can pretty much jam with those scissors. They're so sharp. You can just sit there and draw with them almost. Um, and you get really, really nice curves. 
So you'll, you will start to notice, not necessarily in this piece, but maybe a little bit here with the, the lock, that was a simple flowing movement with these really sharp scissors. Um, and I love them. And at first I started with like a pair this big and I was like, yeah, yeah. And then I found the absolute biggest pair I could get that were like Japanese steel and really sharp. And they're just, they're heavy, they're awesome. So um, I've grown to really love that tool. I feel like I could sometimes almost just get rid of the wallpaper knife and just use scissors. But the two together is, um, I get all of the cuts necessary, right? Um, so yeah, those, I do use scissors uh, a lot actually. And I actually use them more and more as time goes on. Excellent, thanks a lot. Do you want to uh, move on to another uh, piece and we can intersperse yeah. questions as we go? Yeah, absolutely. Before, before the next question, so I selected these uh, next two pieces to show you um, like a visual progression. Um, I was making a piece that had to do with time and death and, and, and these things. So the first thing that came to mind was um, trying bone, which uh, up until the last year, I never really did human forms and I'm getting into them now and I'm really liking it. Um, I don't know if that's because uh, human forms are becoming more popular in contemporary painting. Like a lot of the new paintings I see, you know, uh, just from looking at uh, different galleries and stuff, the human, the figure, the human figure is just becoming more and more popular. Maybe that had some effect. I'm not sure. To me, it's more so like I avoided it for so long. I'm, I'm like happy to, to attempt and use it. And it's just another tool for me to tell a story. So this, um, you know, without doing human hands, I was able to do skeleton hands, which for me was a little easier also because of the color. Creating this color uh, with my, my painting techniques, it was a lot of fun. I like these neutral bone colors. Um, so I didn't want to do just a normal hourglass, not because I didn't think it would look cool. It was because it, got, it was really hard. I, I drew 10 hourglasses and they all were just awful. And I even got to the point where I was like, I'm just, I'm going to Google hourglasses and see what's out there. And I started looking at and they were all just awful looking. I just hated them. So I was like, okay, well I have to rethink what an hourglass is. And so what I did is I had this weird contemporary glass, uh, two pieces where the, um, the hourglass one's full of sand and the other's not, and he's pouring the sand perfectly into the other one. Um, and it's, you know, kind of meant to be like, like death is holding it. It's got the black cloak and the black sleeves and these kind of dirty, gross bones holding them. But um, just one little, uh, you know, technique thing that I've, that I learned with this piece was the cool way of, oh, that sounds kind of bad. The interesting way in which you can have a form pass through another material, but still see the form. So you, you see like the thumb going through the glass. Uh, this is one of the first times I was doing anything like that. And uh, I can, there's gonna be more of that because there's something there. And I might not even stop with just one material, maybe multiple materials. But I really like the fact of um, a form hiding behind something. Um, so this one really didn't cut it. And so uh, I kept pushing it, and that's where I got to this one over here. Let's take a look. So if you follow me on Instagram, uh, at, it's my, my, my handle's at duct tape ponytail. Um, this is like the, the little icon that you'll see on my Instagram is this hand at, or this skeleton hand holding this um, what – kind of morphed into my hourglass. So this was a different look at the hourglass. Um, it, it's an hourglass that couldn't stand up like a normal one because all the ones I saw that stand up, I didn't like. Um, so then this one's like a handheld one that has skulls on either side and the sand can be poured out the eyes. Um, so, you know, I guess you could, you know, you could symbol, say that's a symbol, a symbol of, you know, once the sand is completely poured out, that's it, it's done. Um, but a little, a little back story on the technique. 
I knew in my head that I wanted to make these bones. And from my last attempt at the skeleton hands, they were more just straight lines. So I went into the studio for probably an entire day and made like curved paintings, just a ton of curved paintings um, from really, really, really washed out white textures to more neutral, slowly getting darker, slowly getting darker. And so I had, uh, you know, uh, um, a huge stack of these curved, neutral, wavy paintings. And that's where I found that if I could cut the bones in the perfect place, it would give it that like little bit of value change. So it, lo it, it would give the, the hands more dimension than that. And um, for this piece, I had to revert back to my old ways. So with that, with that one, it was more like, oh, put it here. I'll put it here. I messed it up. I'll put some black over it, kind of erase it to get started, uh, to, to start over. With this one, I was like, you know what? It's so technical. I drew the whole thing out by hand, numbered every single one of the pieces and cut every single piece. And I did two of them at the same time. So I have another one of these at the house. And... Um, it was very tedious. It wasn't very fun, which is a bummer because I really like it. I mean, I think it's like, I think it's visually strong. Um, it encompasses a lot of the ways I like to create, um, but it was just so tedious. So, you know, every once in a while, I will, I will jump back to my old ways. Uh, yeah, so Cullen, maybe this is a good time for an additional question if there is one. Absolutely. Uh, there's a question here from Stephanie who asks, you know, of, of all the many media you could choose to work with and, and themes uh, that you could choose to work with, what inspired you to start collaging in particular? Um, so kind of going back to the wallpaper, when I was hanging wallpaper, which is not a fun job, it's, I will say I got in great shape because my hands were like this all day long pressing against the wall and you know, carrying huge buckets of glue and stuff like that. But I was constantly getting in trouble. So when, when we did renovations on hotels, the first thing you do is you'd go in and you would strip the old wallpaper. Well, I had figured out ways that before I stripped it, I could get my, my knife and draw something uh, on the wall and then just strip parts. And I could step back and I could make these huge drawings on the wall with like uh, net positive and negative space, really simple stuff. But um, I was constantly getting in trouble for stuff like that. Uh, so, um, I mean, I would show up to the job on some days and they'd be like, yo, you need to hide. The, the, the manager's looking for whoever did this to all these rooms. And so that was something that was constantly going. It's one of those things where like the, uh, the process kind of just picked me and all of a sudden I was like, oh yeah, this is cool. So I knew um, you take that and you couple that with what I said earlier about painting. Um, collage gives me the ability to, to make the lines, to make the edges and the compositions in the timely manner that I, that I am making it, that will hold my interest in a way that, uh, painting, I don't know, I still paint. Like the other night I painted, I do watercolor for fun. If I go on trips, I'll do watercolors, but it's not like the microphone I want to use to, it's, I don't want to put those out in the world. It's, it's important. Um, and it gives me the ability to really admire good paintings um, and to look at them critically. But for me, paint just on the canvas and that's it, just doesn't do it for me. For me, I like the, uh, I've just found a home in gluing things to the wall where at one, at one point in my life, I hated gluing stuff to a wall. I wanted to do anything but glue something to a wall. Now it's the only thing I want to do. I don't want to go to work some days because I want to work on my, my, my body of work, of gluing things on the wall. So it's, it's funny that, like, that transition that occurred. Mm. Fascinating. Um, and there's, I could put a question to you. Um, maybe we have time to talk about one more piece and then maybe another question or two. Does that sound good? That sounds great. And, and I think... Um, Yep, let's do that. This is going to be the last piece we'll take you to uh, this evening. I'm sorry, I was waiting for the camera crew, but they are waiting on me. All right, so the last piece here is uh, essential workers, a term that we've all become quite familiar with. Um, 
And I probably wouldn't make another one called Essential Workers at this point, but this was like in March when, you know, things were being shut down. Um, people were working from home, but some people weren't fortunate enough to work from home. Um, uh, as a teacher, you know, they, uh, they at the end of the day, they said, hey, we're taking two weeks off for, for this pandemic. Um, and so that was strange. Um, and on my way home, sitting at the intersection, and I might have said this in the video already, I saw a bus next to me, a couple people with masks, a couple people not. And it was just a powerful visual image. Um, so I, you know, the second I got home, I get, get home and, and start sketching out and start planning and start thinking about how I want to do this and uh, put a piece of the paper in my studio and just slowly through, you know, each day threw a little bit on there, but worked on other things, threw a little bit on there, work on other things. Um, at that time too, I started to create a bunch of yellow uh, using um, like rubber, like 12 inch rollers and creating, uh, you know, pushing out these yellows and then letting them dry and then slightly hitting them with some black. And it would give this like nice texture and value change over the yellow. It was at that time that I started playing with that. So I was like, I'm not going to make these, these blue and white HRT buses that we have in Norfolk. I'm going to make like a yellow bus. Um, so the yellow for me is this like color that I never really cared about until I started rolling it on paper and I've fallen in love with it. I love, I love using yellow, but I don't wear like, I don't, well, I'm wearing yellow socks right now, but for the most part, I don't wear a lot of yellow. Um, but yeah, within the last year, yellow has been, been really cool. The other thing about essential workers in the yellow is that it, it connects to the straps on the N95s or N94s. I forget what they're called. And um, yeah, there's like a, a little bit of a connection there. And then there's just the connection of like the yellow school bus type thing. So this piece is loosely based around the intersection of Princess Anne and Monticello. Um, it's not identical, but in my head, it's, it looks exactly like it was. And as we kind of come to the end of this piece of this uh, of the talk, I've had this thought lately that um, you know it's really important I think to talk about our work. Um, it's a little awkward sometimes to talk on it on a stage, you know, like this. But you know, between artists, I think it's really important because um, having honest conversations about what's working and what's not and what other people see. I had a, a, a painter that's actually talking here in, in, uh, on Wednesday. Um, she asked me for a favor and I said, yeah, that's, I'll do that, but you have to look at this PDF of my work and give me feedback. So it was a nice trade off, but you know, all of, all of her feedback was your work's threatening and ominous. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I kind of like that. You know, I, I like that you see it in that light. Um, but I think you can over talk, right? So I'm listening to that video that we, we filmed previously. And I feel like sometimes um, you can over talk. It's like a memory you had when you were a kid. You know how it is. But in reality, your life experiences have changed what really happened somewhat. I think once I make a piece, sometimes that can kind of happen, right? That can, the, the story behind it can change a little bit. Um, but yeah, I don't know where I was going with that. Why don't we take a question? <laughs> sure. Well, we could get a little bit technical, um, combining a couple of questions. Uh, also, by the way, there's a comment in here that says, um, what, a great, what a great effect you get, you know, from the techniques that you use. So, and I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. And I oh, encourage, thank you. Yes, I encourage anyone uh, who wow. can to come and see these in person. There's no camera that really uh, takes the place of, you know, seeing these with the, with the human eye. So it's, it's really something special. Um, so thank you very much. Absolutely. Um, so this other question is, is it, is it some sort of adhesive that you use to attach your pieces together? And if so, what, what kind of adhesive is that? We're assuming that it's not uh, wall wallpaper glue. No, but I wouldn't discount using wallpaper glue. And a matter of fact, I tried to use it before, but it was, I mean, first of all, um, I, I have experimented with like going to abandoned buildings and, and wallpaper, like making a bunch of paper and collaging like in person, the, the boarded up windows. Um, and I used wallpaper glue for that because I knew that the first or second rain that hit it, it was going to start coming down or start to deteriorate. 
Um, and I know you can mix in like an acrylic medium that'll, it's kind of like wheat pasting almost. Um, so when I first started doing collages, before I was like really getting serious, I was using like uh, polyurethane in my bedroom. <laughs> and so like I'm sitting at my desk and using this like really fumy stuff and it was taking forever to dry and it was getting all over and it was awful. But that is like me being naive, not knowing what I want to do, but, but knowing that I want to like glue paper down, but not, I'm like, okay, I can't use Elmer's. It's a piece of wood and paper. What do I do? So I was using like polyurethane. And then someone once said, you know, I teach and I use uh, Mod Podge. So I was like, ooh, okay. So I went to the store and I bought uh, orange Mod Podge. It had all this gloss. And I was like, I don't like the gloss. And I was like, oh, you, there's multiple kinds of Mod Podge. And then I got the yellow container, which is the matte. And first of all, I love the smell of the matte. But also, it was so easy. Um, it just went on so easy. Um, up until that point, I thought that you glue the back of something and you stick it down and that's it. Because when you're doing wallpaper, that's what you do. Um, but the Mod Podge taught me, no, once you put it down, you go over the top of it and you smooth the top of it down. And it kind of gives it this coating, which saturates the color, seals it in, flattens the surface for the next piece. And uh, so for a while in the beginning, I was using Mod Podge, right, the mat. But then, um, you know, just learning the tricks of the trade, I was like, this is, you know, I need to be using more archival uh, acid-free stuff. I don't know what's in Mod Podge. Maybe it is, but I don't think it is. So it was suggested that I try using like book binding glue. And so through uh, talking to some of my art friends, I found, a, you can probably get it anywhere, but I use this store Talus in Brooklyn. Uh, a lot of artists know about it. Um, they're like a book binding archival business. And they have a product called Jade Glue, um, 403 Jade Glue. And I bought a tub of it and I haven't changed it since. I've been using that same glue. There's probably an even better glue out there and I'll maybe find it. Uh, maybe somebody can tell me about it, but that's what I'm using now. Um, I water it down to varying degrees depending on what I'm working with. Sometimes I like a really watered down glue because I want the paper saturated. When I put it on the uh, surface, I want it to bunch up. I want it to tear when I'm pulling it. Other times, if I'm really, if I'm doing something like putting a mask on a little figure and it has to be perfect, uh, I'll use less watered down pieces, a little bit more tacky, thicker, thicker glue. I will, this leads me to something that's off the topic of glue is it was like mind blow. Two things I learned as far as process goes that was mind blowing. First, a, an acrylic sheet, just a, a sheet of plexiglass, uh, putting that on my table and, and doing all of my gluing on that piece of plexiglass. Oh my God. Before I was doing it right where I was cutting stuff and it just got sticky. Paper was sticking to my uh, self-healing cutting mat. It was a mess, but I did that for years. I did that. And then like maybe two years ago, I got this acrylic sheet and I was like, oh damn, I could have this like gluing station that I can move around and I can just rinse it off when I'm done or I can just keep the glue on there and let it dry and keep, that was a big thing. You, having like a, a portable like sheet to, to use for my gluing. The second thing, and I don't know why it took me so long to figure it out is a pair of tweezers. Tweezers are just, oh, uh, they're just an extension of my hand. I'm, I'm, all of my letterings, I have to use tweezers. And I even got to the point where I'm using them so much, I'm picking up big pieces because I'm mo moving so much. I'll just, I can scrape the table and just pick up a sheet of paper with tweezers. So I'll always have a pair of tweezers in my hands when I'm gluing. Um, I'm giving you guys all my secrets. I'm like, no one start collaging. Try something. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Well, thanks for that, Andy. It's really yeah, fascinating absolutely. and uh, I think inspiring to a lot of people as well. Um, so final question before we wrap up, since we're at time, what is next for you? Where do you want to go? What do you have on the horizon? Um, okay, so that is the, that is the like, that's the big question, right? Um, I, uh, I'm always worried. I'm always worried about what's going to be next. So I think I overwork and overapply to things. If I told you how much money I wasted on applying to shows, residencies, um, 
it's awful the amount of money I've wasted. So if you're feeling some rejection from putting yourself out there and not getting that feedback, trust me, you can reach out to me. We can talk about it all day long. Um, it's just part of the game, right? I mean, it's really easy to be like, why is that person finding success and I'm not? And then I, I have to, you know, have to remind myself, like, dude, this is a killer show. I'm getting to do this. I'm getting to meet all these awesome people. Um, this is what it's about, right? Um, I also teach a lot. So that, you know, that feeds part of, um, you know, helping people and, and putting a positive energy out in the world. So what's next? Uh, I'm at a place where, you know, I've, I've had, I've got a lot going on. I have uh, three pieces at the MoCA currently, and that's up until June. And then three pieces in their satellite or two pieces in their satellite gallery. That's up till June as well. So really what I'm going to do once this stuff comes down next week, and I've already started, is I'm, um, I've got this idea. We'll see how long I hang with it, but I'm just going to keep cranking out work. Um, I'm working with a photographer that takes uh, pictures around L.A. and on the outskirts of L.A., and he's kind enough to throw me some. And so I'm recreating his photographs, but, uh, but adding some things in there. I don't want to just go in too much to it, but... I'm adding things in there to, again, build story, um, build emotion and, and things like that that maybe some uh, people can connect with. Um, and my ideas are so big, there's no way I can do it all. So that's what's on my plate for now. Although, uh, you know, I'm always going to keep experimenting. And I encourage if you're an artist and, and you like art making to always experiment. So yesterday I spent 30 bucks on just oil bars which is, you know, drawing material, uh, an expensive drawing material. And I spent last night drawing with these oil bars. Now, I might not ever use those oil bar drawings that I made last night, but the hope is that that will be one of the next steps in my collages, not just paint to start throwing in some drawing material as well. Um, I think I'm going to stick with working on paper for a while because I, I've just, I love the way it looks. I've framed two pieces this size recently and they are just, wow. I mean, they, they look amazing. Um, I'm like, whoa, that looks like, that looks like a real piece of art. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but I do not mind at all posting pieces like this. It almost takes on the quality of like a tapestry hanging from a wall. It really shows you when you walk up to this and you see the curling edges that it's paper. And I want, and I want my audience to, to see that as well. So, um, What's, on, what's next for me? Go to the MOCA. This shows up for another week. Please go to the Virginia MOCA. Uh, I'm in a group show called Nourish, and I've worked with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. I, I spent some time with them and their volunteers and created three pieces in response to that. They've given me very good position in that museum, so when you go in the gallery, you won't be able to miss it. Their Town Bank Satellite Gallery, which is across the street, I have two pieces in there. Please give me a follow at uh, Duct Tape Ponytail on Instagram. And uh, I'm on Facebook too, but that's more like just like showing my aunt and sisters <laughs> kind of what I'm doing. Um, but also I want to take this last second to open the door. One thing I do is I email professional artists who have something that I like all the time. And I say, please look at my work. Maybe one out of all of them that I've emailed have, have written me back. But I'm going to keep doing that. And I encourage you to, if you have questions or you want uh, someone to throw, um, throw you some suggestions or, or give you some feedback, email me, message me on Instagram. I'm totally down with connecting with other artists and helping you, inspiring you, and you doing the same for me. So, yeah. Thank you, guys. Well, thanks so much, Andy. Um, it's been a real pleasure uh, listening to you, following you through the show, and getting insight into your process. And uh, we're, we're so glad to, to have you represented here at the Gordon Galleries and um, want to thank everybody else who's been part of this program as well. Uh, behind the scenes there with you, Andy in the gallery, want to thank Sterling Goulart and Sarah Glaser and Jenny Detona helping to operate the camera. Also want to thank uh, Christina Lapuma of the Office of Community Engagement for helping to host this webinar. And um, yeah, one more week left of this show. If you're an ODU person, you can come in and see it in person. Unfortunately, uh, because of the pandemic, um, we're allowing ODU people in only at the moment, but you can go to odu.edu slash arts or follow arts at ODU 
at ODU Arts on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to find out how you can log into Gordon, the telepresence robots, and uh, see the show that way. So once again, thanks, everybody. It's been a great night, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.